The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. This is the Lawfare Archive. Hello, this is Lawfare intern Christiana Wayne with an episode from the Lawfare Archives for July 18th, 2021. The United States is withdrawing from Afghanistan after a two-decade-long war. Left behind is a fractious government and a Taliban force gradually retaking land and power. At particular risk is the female population of Afghanistan which has suffered under the Taliban's repressive laws. For today's episode from the archives, I chose a conversation from 2013 between Alan Rosenstein and the Afghan politician and women's rights activist, Fazia Kufi. At the time, Kufi was a member of parliament and was planning a presidential run. And she talked to Rosenstein about women in Afghanistan and the continued threat of the Taliban during and after US occupation. She is still in Afghanistan's parliament today, and most recently served as a member of the Afghan delegation negotiating peace with the Taliban. She also recently called the ongoing U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan a moral defeat. Apologies in advance for the quality of this recording, but we thought the content was nonetheless worth sharing. Hello, and welcome to the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Benjamin Wittes. Today, something different on the podcast. Fauzia Kufi is a member of the Afghan parliament and vice president of its National Assembly. She is also running to be Afghanistan's first female president in the upcoming 2014 elections. Kufi was forced to leave school when the Taliban took power in Afghanistan, and she was widowed when the Taliban imprisoned her husband shortly after their marriage. Kufi is now a leading advocate for the rights of women and girls in Afghanistan and has recently published a memoir, The Favored Daughter, about her life. Kufi recently gave the closing remarks at the Harvard Women's Law Association's annual conference. Lawfare's Alan Rosenstein spoke with her about the current state of Afghanistan and the challenges facing her country. Ms. Kufi, thank you so much for joining us. The first thing I'd like to ask is just to have you describe the road that brought you to becoming the first female candidate for president in Afghanistan. Well, uh, I come from a political family, so politics is like inside my uh, blood. But um, but because of the losses I had in politics, because of the fact that I lost my father, he was assassinated, and my brothers in politics. Um, and then, of course, our house was looted, and like we paid a high price for being in politics. Therefore. I didn't want to become a politician, but the fact that there was the civil war in Afghanistan and then during Taliban time, there was a lot of, uh, what I have experienced was um, so much discrimination and injustice towards citizens, including women. That gives me the passion and the determination to, to come to politics. And I think after 2001, when the new opportunity came to Afghanistan, where everybody could get involved in politics or social life, um, I decided to run to, to office, and I was elected um, as member of parliament in two, 2005, and then the first female deputy speaker of parliament in that year, and then it continued. And then the second term I was elected was in 2010, with uh, lots of votes, and so I'm still a member of parliament, the chairperson of Women and Human Rights Commission. One of the most disturbing, if not the most disturbing part of the Taliban rule, um, certainly to I think a lot of Westerners, was its treatment of women and girls. And I was wondering if you could describe how the conditions of women and girls has improved or has changed since the Taliban were overthrown, and, and what else needs to be done? 
Well, actually, what Taliban demonstrated, from my perspective, is not what actual Islam is about. Basically, they uh, are following the neighboring countries' um, agenda and, and programs. Um, Afghanistan has become a battlefield between um, the neighboring countries, Pakistan, Iran, India relationship, and to some extent now China because it's a growing power. So during Taliban, um, women were the main victim and sacrifice of Taliban regime because uh, they were, first of all, deprived of their basic rights, which is the right to education. Um, and they were also deprived of going in the streets without, you know, those basic things like going to the street without a male companion, uh, going to the doctor without a male companion. So, for instance, if you had no uh, husband, brother or whoever in the family to accompany you, you then hardly could go to the doctor. Like uh, when they put my husband in jail, I had to take a taxi to go to, to follow my husband to see where are they taking him. Uh, they took him to the intelligence service number three, which is the most, which used to be the most dangerous um, organization within Taliban regime. And I took a taxi, and the taxi driver told me, Ms. Kufi, I mean, he told me, sister, because he didn't know why I was covered with burqa. He said, I will not take you because if Taliban stop us, then it will, um, they will ask you what is the relationship. So we had to uh, call each other's brothers and sister and exchange the father name just to be sure to take a taxi. So ha that was how it was during Taliban. Um, I guess um, anybody who would like to, um, you know, anybody who would like to finish a nation, by killing a nation, you, you the, the next generation will come. But if you stop a nation from education, that's the time you, you really kill a nation. And that's something Taliban did. They were actually measuring the beard of, um, of man. It had to be a certain measure. If it's not, then they will start beating them on the streets. You know, Afghan people are so protective towards their wife. Like, um, the men are so protective. Um, it's a sign of love if you, like, protect your wife and don't let her go out of the, the house, etc. But during Taliban, there were... Uh, occasions that a man denied her his relationship with his wife because a woman was wearing, for instance, a, uh, a white burqa and the white was the flag of Taliban color. So they were like so much, uh, um, they were they were regarded regard this as a anti-Taliban thing. So they, they start beating a woman with white burqa on the street. And then this gentleman who was the husband said, oh, no, she is not my wife because she wanted to protect himself. They were taken to the prison, and we don't know, God knows what happened to him. So to that level, people of Afghanistan, they damage our identity, actually. My understanding is, is that your own education was interrupted by the Taliban. Yes. And I was hoping you could, you could tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, I was a, a medical student. That was the dream of my mother and the whole family. And in Afghanistan, when you're a top student, you basically go to the, you know, your preferences, top three faculties. It's either um, law. Uh, top top is uh, medical law engineering so the three top faculty students could go to these faculties and I went to I managed to get to medical uh, university and I wanted to become a doctor but uh, Taliban came and it's interesting because the, the day that Taliban came to Kabul they, 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 they got to Kabul I was still noting down my notes with the hope that you know they will at least an, uh, allow girls even with burqa or whatever hijab at least we could go to school and university but uh, unfortunately they announced uh, that schools are closed and that's something which I can't still understand because uh, their own uh, wives and their own sisters could go to some of these Middle East countries or even they could go to Pakistan for treatment to a female doctor but they didn't allow a female doctor in their own country uh, later on I think in the last years of their government they allowed the last years of uh, the last grade of uh, medical faculty to go to s university, but I was too late because it was one generation cut off for education. Obviously, the position of women and girls has improved dramatically since the Taliban have left, and, and the fact that you're a high-level politician and you're running for president of Afghanistan is, is an indication of that. Um, but I was wondering what else needs to be done and, and sort of what, what are the un unfinished uh, parts of reform mm. in, in this sense in Afghanistan today? Um, that's true. Um, I think uh, we, by no means we can compare the current situation with Taliban regime because, uh, you know, it's huge progress in politics, in social life, economy as well for man and woman, but in particularly for women. But still, uh, there are a lot of uh, women of Afghanistan are suffering from a lot of violence, so we really need to improve the laws. And then in the peace process, in the so-called peace process by President Karzai, 
uh, we fear that there is an, um, a, lack, a lack of women present um, in that process. Uh, it's basically being leaded by men, while we understand that the main victim of insecurity, again, is a woman. So women needs to be included according to the government commitments and also international community commitment. Women need to be included in the peace process and, and negotiations. We ha there is a, a peace council uh, established by President Karzai, and there are like 70 members of that peace council. Out of that, nine are women. Um, in that uh, peace council. So they, they are supposed to follow and pursue the peace process with Taliban. Uh, but the nine women are basically the, how shall I put it, the nine women are the, not the true voice of Afghan women. They are the weak women. They just bring them to, those, uh, to that council just to demonstrate that they actually have women in that council. But they are uh, already always being like marginalized from the discussions. So therefore, I think, um, I know that uh, many leaders around the world, including the United States leaders, and I know that uh, also President Obama in the last press conference with our president, they, with, with Karzai, they said that uh, Afghan constitution and women rights will be safeguarded, but that has to come to practice. Um, because a main fear and concern is that post-2014, when the international community withdraw, in the worst case scenario, a uh, woman might go back to where you know, they started in 2001, which, was, which is uh, a tough life. So this is something we need to improve woman involvement in peace process. And of course, political participation of women. And I guess um, you know, the fact that we need to have women in the leadership of the country. Let's try a different experience. Afghanistan was led by man all its history. And we see that there are problems, so let's give a chance for a woman. <laughs> and, and just for our, our listeners, um, the Afghan constitution does have an explicit equality guarantee. That's uh, Article 22, I believe. You mentioned that one of the main victims, if not the main victim of insecurity, are, are actually women. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about, about what you mean. You know, when there is insecurity, women will be affected in so many ways. One of that is like the education, like the schools will be uh, closed in many places. Right now, uh, in the places where there is insecurity, you know, a lot of schools are closed. And in the places where there is security, girls' schools are being poisoned. Like last year, a lot of Taliban uh, poisoned girls' schools. So on a daily basis, we, hear, um, we, we keep hearing news about girls' schools were poisoned by chemicals so that it affects female education, basically. So the first thing is their education that will be affected. The second thing is in a war zone, like in a war between the war groups, it's actually women's rights that will be affected by either rape or violence or different kinds of the war crimes that could happen. And we have witnessed in Afghanistan it did happen in the past. So that way also women, women um, rights will be um, violated. And plus that there is an extreme, I think there is a, a radicalism and extremism in grow in, from our neighboring country. And different perspectives about Islam, and there is no, sometimes there is no unified uh, perspective about Islam and women rights, could also affect, um, like we have experienced Taliban regime. If in the worst case scenario, something like Taliban regime comes back, they're always claiming that we want women Islamic rights. And as a woman who lived under Taliban, I know what does they mean. I, I know they, they mean that, you know, their own interpretation of uh, Islam for women. So those are like the things that we are, we are worried um, Plus that they lose their husbands, they lose their sons in the war, they lose the, the man of the family, and they have to become the female-headed family economy-wise. Most of the women are not educated. It becomes so difficult for them right now. Also, we are working with female-headed families and with w women who are deprived of education. But now that their school age is gone and they still want to continue on an accelerated education just to feed their family. So we know how difficult it is for them when they lose their husbands or their brothers or whatever the male of, male of the family in the war, how difficult it is for them to get back to normal life and become the female-headed family. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast for the stories. I wanted to follow up on the issue of, of women becoming the heads of the family. So it, it seems pretty clear that um, one of the requirements for stability in Afghanistan or anywhere is a functioning economic system. Since 
women's involvement in an economic system is going to be absolutely critical. I was wondering where you think um, that stands right now in Afghanistan um, in terms of involving women broadly throughout the economy and, and what needs to be done to ensure that half of the w potential workforce is, is being productive. Exactly, exactly. No, I fully agree. I mean, nowhere in the world uh, the economy will, gr will grow if there is no, um, you know, um, healthy um, involvement of half part of the society, and in Afghanistan, more than half part of society, which are women. And um, uh, there are, right now, there are some business, women are involved in agriculture, and that is an informal uh, income for women. Uh, women are involved in small um, entrepreneurship, uh, which is a, a good income. But the main business is with man, <laughs> like many parts of the world. Um, what we have asked um, in the Tokyo conference, which was held, uh, this was a donor conference held for Afghanistan in June. Um, many donor countries went and committed their funds for Afghanistan. I think $60 billion, $16 billion was committed to Afghanistan. Our proposal in that conference was that 30% uh, of all the money that comes to Afghanistan should be effectively allocated for women um, economy empowerment. Through that, we could, you know, empower um, women companies, uh, small businesses um, in the rural villages of Afghanistan to reduce this gap of village and, and city life. Um, I think um, this is something we still have to follow up, and um, um, especially with transition, uh, we need to make sure that there are specific budget allocated for women in transition because, you know, transition is not just a military transition that the international community leaves, but what, what next when they leave in terms of economy? And I think uh, we hardly touch that part of um, transition. We basically talk about military transition, but we don't know what are... Nobody talk about the fact that how are the economical implications of withdrawal going to be on people of Afghanistan, but on women, basically, because already a lot of women started losing contracts. And they, when they used to have big contracts with, uh, I don't know, military ISAF or NATO, uh, but right now they are losing those contracts. So we haven't talked about, uh, we haven't basically looked at that pick, that part of um, withdrawal, which is the impact of withdrawal on, on people's life economy-wise. Already a lot of translators and a lot of uh, aid workers are losing their jobs because of the cut of the funding, uh, because of the fact that uh, the, the, the military withdrawal is happening. So I think there should be a specific budget for women um, uh, from big donors uh, to improve women economy, because that way, you know, not that you support women, but you support their family and their children, and their children will go to school. So if a woman is able to feed the family, she will send her, his, her boy to, to school. And then later on, we don't have to have an educated society. We will have an educated society. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the withdrawal that you mentioned. So this is one of the cornerstones of President Obama's foreign policies, is to remove as many troops out of Afghanistan as possible, to leave a, s a small core contingent, but to really give the main responsibility for security to the Afghan military and police. Well, I have a different view on it. I think um, it's um, it's early, um, and I think uh, still I'm not sure if Afghanistan is really um, a secure place enough so that it's not any more a security threat to the world. Uh, given the fact that um, both of both the international community and the government of Afghanistan less focus was on where the terrorism is actually coming in the region, like where the source of terrorism was, but basically they were engaged in leaves, we call them, not in the roots. Therefore, there is less guarantee that terrorism is actually, you know, being dismantled and um, um, it's finished. No, th there is no that guarantee. I think still there is terrorism act, act, there is suicide bombing, there is organized crimes, there is war in some parts of Afghanistan. So 2014, for two reasons, uh, I think... Uh, was not a realistic year. First, for presidential election, because it's a very important year in terms of political transition. We need to have political transition first before we go to military transition. And second is in terms of um, the fact that, uh, you know, it's uh, the international community started supporting Afghan forces only in 2008, after 2008. So still, in terms of training and in terms of capacity and in terms of equipment, they really need to be well equipped. I don't question the motivation and the morale of our uh, our troops in Afghanistan. Sometimes they do wonderful job. I remember there was a, a Talib, Taliban attack in one of the in U.S. Uh, embassy in Afghanistan last um, 
was this 2012 September, I guess. There was a suicide bombing that came to explode himself in front of everybody and kill lots of civilians. So this police officer hold, hacked this um, suicide bomber just to avoid civilian casualty and threw himself with the suicide bomber to the river just to, uh, he knew that he will be died because he, the, the suicide bomber will explode himself. But he just wanted to avoid civilian casualties. So that's how the morale and the motivation of our forces are in terms of protection of civilians, in terms of uh, you know standing against enemies of Afghanistan. But they still need to have um, equipment, uh, air air equipment like uh, helicopters and that because they're still we're still using the old Russian helicopters. They need to be provided with um, you know the rocket the Taliban target could target 20 kilometers. The rocket that our forces, security, like police and army use, could target three kilometers. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge uh, gap. So we need to adjust ourselves um, on based on the situation. And therefore, I think for that reason also, it's a bit early. But I know that you have, uh, that this is now set, and I know that it's part of the strategy. So I think we need to focus on two things. First, uh, political transition 2014 should happen really in a way that the re result and the outcome of election is a change for the interests of people of Afghanistan. Second, I think uh, lots of investment should go to uh, buying uh, security equipments like, you know, we need to have a well-equipped Afghan forces, security and police. The defense is doing fine, but still our police need to have um, training and capacity that they require. The last question I wanted to ask you is about drone campaigns in, in Afghanistan. This is a, a, a very controversial issue here um, in the United States. The, the government defends it on the grounds that it's a very important weapon against terrorists and militants and that it's one that minimizes civilian casualties relative to other options. But a lot of critics here believe that there are actually far more civilians killed than, than we realize and that, in fact, it, it turns more people against the United States um, and so I was wondering what your personal views are on, on, on the campaign in Afghanistan and, and also your perception of public opinion in Afghanistan on, on the drone strikes. Well, I know that there are some, uh, the, some uh, peace activists or anti-war movements in your countries that um, they have a different view about Afghanistan war. Um, I'm also a civil society activist, and I'm against any war because I know that uh, the war will basically victimize more women and children. But the situation in Afghanistan is different. We need to make our views based on the ground realities in Afghanistan. I know that if there was no war, for instance, in two after 2001, what will happen to what will happen to the human rights of those hundreds and thousands of girls that they need to go to school? They also they also have a human right that one has to consider. What will happen to the human rights of women, hundreds and thousands of women in Afghanistan that they want to access health clinics, while during Taliban they didn't. So uh, it's, it's always easy to judge from um, kilometers and thousand kilometers distance, but when you are on the ground, you see the situation is different. Now on the drones in Afghanistan, there is two different perspectives. In some part of the country when it happens, of course it's like in the middle of the night and it doesn't give a nice feeling of uh, of the U.S. Uh, operations, but on the other hand, it has so far been the effective means of uh, minimizing uh, civilian casualty and addressing or going behind the terrorists. So those who think that we need to finish the terrorism, I think they, f they still see it as an effective means. But on the other hand, there is no perfect thing. Everything in this world has their pros and cons. So there is no perfect war, so to say. In war, people don't distribute sweets. They have to fight, and they, they might, might kill each other, and it happens also that you know, poor civilian casual people are also killed. I'm not, you know, how shall I put it? I'm not pro-night um, operation, but in the meantime, I know that this has been uh, an effective means of uh, arresting Taliban and their leaders and Al-Qaeda and their leaders. So as somebody who has been victim of Taliban regime, I don't want their comeback. And whatever means that could reduce, the, minimize their comeback, I will appreciate it. But on the other hand, you will see that, um, you know, 
uh, people use, uh, unfortunately, um, bad examples of U.S. Uh, presence in Afghanistan. For instance, if this American man entered the house of um, uh, you know, civilians in the middle of the night and killed 12 or, t or 13 or 16 people, it's not a good role model for your presence. But on the other hand, one has to, one has to keep in mind that, um, that it was because of uh, your presence in Afghanistan that um, I could go to parliament or, or many others, other women could go to parliament. Thank you very much. It's an Thank inspiring you. story, and Thank I wish you. you the best of luck. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Lawfare Podcast, produced in collaboration with the Brookings Institution. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's an episode we recommend. Hi, I'm theme park journalist Carly Wiesel, and my job is to bring you the weirdest, wackiest theme park stories on my podcast, Very Amusing. Hear how Disney built a Star Wars-themed land from the people who built it, the wild way Butterbeer was first created, and this week, get a secret look at what happens inside Disneyland's members-only Club 33 and its extremely private-themed bar. Very Amusing is jam-packed with exclusive details about Star Wars, Marvel, and Jurassic World attractions, hilarious celebrity interviews, and, well, everything you've ever wanted to know about theme parks but haven't found anywhere else. Want to go on a wild ride that won't cost you hundreds in admission tickets? Listen to Very Amusing with Carly Wiesel on the Acast app or wherever you get your podcasts. Acast, Acast, Acast recommends. recommends.